My parents said for years that they would go on their dream trip to Alaska when my mom retired. She is still several years from retiring, but last December my dad told her that they should go ahead and do it anyway, so they started making plans for this past summer. In March or so, I jokingly said that they should stick me in their bags and let me come with them. A couple weeks later, they asked if I was really serious about wanting to go, and would my husband like to go as well. They said that they would help us pay for it as an anniversary gift, if we were okay with helping my dad and carrying luggage and whatnot. He was in a wheelchair. Of course we wanted to go. Fast forward to the summer, and we had nine amazing days in Alaska with my parents. They live three states away, and we only got to see them for the occasional four-day weekend every few months, so getting to spend that much time with them was amazing. We saw moose, bears, and caribou. We went on dog sled rides, and we got out on some boats to ride the rapids or look for whales. On Father's Day morning, after he talked to my brother and had grandkids on video chat, we all went out on a whale-watching trip. It was perfect. Even the guides on the boat said it was the most amazing trip they had ever seen. He got to see nine humpback whales jump out of the water together as they caught fish in a net of bubbles. He got to see four killer whales, and one of them even breached the water in an awesome jump that is rare in the wild. And he got it all on a perfect sunny day, not a cloud in the sky to cover the mountains and glaciers all around us. On the way back, he and my mom said that this was what they had come to Alaska to see, and that they couldn't have asked for a more amazing trip. An hour later, my dad had a cardiac event that he wouldn't wake up from. I miss him every day, but I'm so incredibly lucky that I got to spend that much time with him right before he left us, and that my dad got pretty much the perfect last week of his life, surrounded by people he loved. Not many people get that. It was the summer of 2003 and I had just turned 21. I was sitting on my back porch with friends drinking beer like we had done every day since school had ended. I saw the number to call on the can and thought it would be funny to give Keystone Light a call. I called in whilst a little drunk to tell them, I love your beer, I drink it every day. The person on the other end of the line snickered a little bit and asked how many of the products my household consumed in a week. Like how many cases? I asked. They wanted to know how many cans. I told them it would be a little bit for me to do the math. There were like eight or nine guys there that were hanging out at my house on a regular basis, chugging beer like it was our job. I did the math as quickly as I could and came back with about 800 cans per week. I thought it was a fair estimate. The person again laughed a little, but kept their professionalism while taking down my information so that they could send me a care package. And only a few days after the call, I received said package. It contained a hat, a shirt, a koozie, a bottle opener, marker, and a letter addressed to me from the company thanking me for being a patron. We all kind of laughed about it and continued on with our summer of drinking madness. We were having the summer of spring breaks. We would pick a new year each week and only listen to music from that year. I can't recall what year we were on when I received a call about a week after getting the care package. Are you Danbag213? Said the voice that was calling on my cell phone from a hidden number. Yeah, who are you? I said while wearing the shirt and hat that I got from the package, and finishing one of their beers. The lady identified herself as a person from a promotional agency and said that, because you love that beer so much, that they were sending us to Los Angeles to board the Stuff Magazine party jet and fly us into Vegas to stay at the Palms for the weekend. Yeah, right, who the fuck is this? I asked. She repeated herself and reiterated the fact that it was serious. The trip happened about two months later. It ended up that there were seven other groups on the trip and all of them had entered this contest through a form on the inside of the case of one of their beers. I had just gotten lucky and maybe because I called and said the right things that they still had a spot to fill. They gave us coupons to eat at all the places at the Palms and the only money that I had to bring was money to gamble. We went back to our rooms on the second night to find that they had given us a Clive backpack, Mancho pint glasses, and a portable CD player. It ended up being a promotional event for a lingerie company that was having a show out by the pool and the beer company together. We saw many celebrities and drank lots of beer and cocktails while gambling and partying like rock stars. We had like backstage passes that got us into all the clubs and events without having to wait in line and we got free drinks wherever we went. It was something that I'll probably never experience again and it was crazy. Keystone Light, I freaking love you. 
I had just turned 30, some failed relationships behind me, as we all have, including a cheating fiancé. Anyway, I went out for breakfast with my mother one morning to one of our favorite restaurants. We sat down, and then I heard someone calling my name from the next booth over. I look over and see a friend of mine, and with her is a beautiful woman, blonde hair, blue eyes, exactly my type. I would love to be able to say I was perfectly suave and swept her off her feet. However, nerves got the better of me. I stammered a hello, mumbled some inane small talk, and even shook her hand at the end of the conversation. I went back to my breakfast feeling like a total buffoon. As I sat there thinking I had to do something to redeem myself, I managed to catch the eye of my friend who was with her and I mouthed, Is she single? She got a little smirk on her face and subtly nodded yes. I just about had a heart attack. At this point I think she lost patience and indicated that she would send me this blonde beauty's email address after she found out if it was okay to do so from her friend. Little did I know that at the same time I was prodding for info, the blonde girl was asking for details about me. Breakfast ended and I said goodbye to the two of them and went home. Two hours later, email address in hand, I sent off my hello message to Heather, that was her name, and immediately got a response. Our first date was a week later. And now, seven years later, we are coming up on our fifth wedding anniversary, and we have a beautiful, sweet little girl who is the spitting image of her mother. Heather carried me through some terrible times when I was the primary caregiver for my mother, who died of cancer after a two-year struggle. I don't know how I would have survived changing my mom's diapers, changing her catheters, all the horrid events that come with home care of a terminal cancer patient, without the constant love and support of this amazing woman. The fact she stayed with me during this time, even though we had just started dating when my mother's diagnosis was discovered, amazes me, and still brings me to tears. I love my wife, and thank goodness I decided to take a day off of work and go to breakfast with my mother. It was the luckiest day of my life. Out of nowhere, my brother was diagnosed with sarcoma cancer at age 17, right before his 18th birthday, in a period of about a month of even discovering it. He was given maximum two years to live, and was told he only had two weeks till he had to lose the arm he had cancer in. We were told the cancer was really rare, and at his age, he was one in 2,000 people with this cancer. There was no guarantee, due to the aggressive nature of his cancer, that he would not lose his other arm also. The doctor also said he would slowly become an amputee, and that's how he would die. My brother refused and said he didn't want to go out like that and would rather die catching a big wave out in the ocean. He's a surfer. Upon hearing this news, my brother ran out of the room and in front of trucks right near the hospital. I ran after him and grabbed him and stopped him from trying to end himself. I said to wait until he heard further news and he agreed that maybe it was for the best. The next 10 days were long and my brother still hadn't made a booking to lose his arm. He slept for 16 hours and I screened most of the phone calls to the house. One phone call in particular I answered and actually woke my brother up to have the phone. This call was what I feel makes myself and my brother so lucky. It was a doctor from California, we lived in Australia, who also received a sample of my brother's tumor and were not allowed to contact the Sydney office at all as it would affect the analysis of the sample. Their findings were that my brother was going to be okay. They said he had the rarest cancer in the world and he is one of seven people with that form of sarcoma cancer. Six of the people with the cancer had it somewhere in their torso area and they all survived fine. My brother and a man somewhere had the cancer on a limb and they were both kind of guinea pigs. They couldn't guarantee my brother's survival but said he had a better chance and he did not have to lose his arm. It went from initially receiving chemo and becoming an amputee to having 70 sessions of radiotherapy on my brother's arm, with now the biggest risk that his arm may develop elephantitis and best result he would lose 25% of movement in his arm. Fast forward the story seven years on and my brother now has a four-year-old daughter, owns his own business, is engaged, and has lost about 15% movement in his arm. But you wouldn't even notice. I feel that given the chances of him having the 6 in 2,000 people with that type of cancer that actually get to live, makes him the luckiest guy on the planet when it comes to cancer. About 15 years ago, I had to go to Vegas for a work thing. I had no extra money, so I really wasn't excited about going at all. Being broke in Vegas is no fun. 
I was there for three nights. The first night I decided that I would play in a $50 poker tournament. It would fill up the evening and that way I wouldn't gamble anywhere else. Bam, I took first place for $1,500. Being responsible, I went and put $1,000 in my bank and kept $500 to play with. The next night, I go to a craps table with $200 and I go on for about a 45 minute roll. This was at the Paris where they have the fire bet, which is a $10 bet that if you hit all six points, it's a thousand to one. I hit that over the course of the 45 minutes and if you know anything about craps, it becomes exponential as you press your wins. So starting with a typical $10 pass line and $20 odds and like the $12 on a six or eight, by the time I finally sevened out, I had $500 on each number and was hitting them over and over. I cashed out with $28,000. The final night I did it again. Just went on a 30 minute run and hit another fire bet, but since I was up so much, I had started at a $25 minimum game. Another $18,000. I basically parlayed $50 into $46,000, which was more than my annual pay at that time. That will never happen again. As a young, dumb teenager, I was free soloing a small mountain without a safety harness. I was about 20 meters or 65 feet off the ground when I reached what I thought was the top. Turned out the top was still going upwards, and the surface was smooth as a baby's bottom, with nothing to grab onto. I tried to descend, but got myself stuck, and after a few minutes I couldn't hold on any longer. I lost my grip and I fell. I dropped 5 meters, 16 feet, and by chance, two tiny trees growing out from a crack in the mountain face caught me. And they did so so perfectly, one under my arm and the other right under one of my knees. From there, I found my way down again, safe and sound. If it hadn't been for those trees, I could have been seriously injured, or dead, as the ground underneath was littered with pointy rocks. I didn't use my luck to win the lottery, but it saved me from a really bad situation. So, it was a late night patrol in Afghanistan. We were tasked with setting up an observation post for the night on a hill above a particularly active area of the city we were in. We would be there for almost the entire night, and this was an area we knew to be pretty active for IEDs. Now, everywhere we went on patrol we had the first guy sweeping with a metal detector looking for signs of IEDs, and this night was no exception. When we got to a good vantage point we were designated spots, and as I was carrying a saw, I was placed on a berm facing down a rotor trail that led up to the hill. Before we got into positions, our combat engineer would sweep the area around our spots to ensure there were no IEDs. He started at the far left of the squad and worked his way toward the road where I was with my team leader. It was late and I was tired of standing so I went to get into position anyway. As I set my saw down on this small berm, I heard my combat engineer shout to hold the fuck on. Mind you, we were supposed to be quiet for this operation. He skipped the next three or so positions and came straight to mine. So I sigh, pick up my saw off its bipods, and he makes his first pass right over where my weapon was. Beep. Whatever intuition he had stopped me from laying down on an IED big enough to dismantle a Humvee, let alone what it would have done to little old me. We ended up spending the rest of the night in a cordon around this sucker until EOD showed up and did a controlled detonation. I have other times I was pretty lucky, but this one definitely takes the cake. I worked at a retail store for luggage where it was base pay plus commission. The other two salespeople were lazy as fuck. They made almost no sales, didn't interact with any of the customers, and basically leaned against the counter sipping coffee and being fake friends with the manager lady. My first week there, I made more commission than they did in an average month. The manager lady was a super bitch. She kept cutting into my hours and said I was making her look bad by making so many sales. She gave me all the shit jobs like taking out the trash every goddamn day, she said because I was the only male and was stronger. Cleaning the bathrooms twice a day, cutting into my sales, reassigning my sales to other people so it looked more even, she said anyway. I lasted three months before the fake friends talked enough shit about he is stealing our sales that the manager fired me. Three months later, I'm working with a company that is flipping houses. 
We get a call from a landlord about a house they wanted to sell because the tenants weren't paying and being a landlord was more of a pain in the ass than he thought. When we get there, guess who was the tenant? Yeah, the bitch manager that fired me. I straight bought her house for cash and evicted her. I've actually been waiting for the right opportunity to tell my story on Reddit. I'm a guy. My real life name is a unisex one, and in fact more commonly a female name. Also, my last name is obviously non-white. This will be important later though. This was back in the mid-2000s when I was a senior in undergrad. I held a scholarship worth $5,000 a year from first year onwards, and one of the conditions of me keeping the scholarship from year to year was maintaining a high enough GPA, somewhere between an A and an A-. minus. Well, in third year, my GPA was just below the threshold, so I ended up losing it for my final year. However, there was an appeals process you could write a letter to, arguing your case for why you should get your scholarship back. So, I wrote this letter coming up with as much bullshit as I could muster. I was a math major, so I was taking harder classes than average. My GPA was well above the threshold the last two years, so this was my only blip. My girlfriend was going through personal problems during the year, so I spent a lot of time and energy supporting her. Probably a few more points, but they were the biggies. Turns out my brother had a friend who was the student rep on the scholarship appeals committee. My bro said that she'd get his friend to do all she could to reinstate my scholarship. It probably couldn't be anything drastic, but she said she'd tried to steer the discussion of the decision in a positive direction. A few weeks later, they mail me a check for five grand and congratulate me on retaining my scholarship. Rad. So I invite my brother's friends for coffee to thank her, but it turned out she had nothing to do with the decision. What actually happened was that the committee members thought I was a girl. Oh look at this girl who just missed out on her scholarship. She's a math major too. We want to support women in science, so we should really consider her case. Oh look, and she has a girlfriend. How can we not support an LGBT woman in science? She's such a role model for other queer women. And look at her last name. She's a visible minority too. Let's support her as much as we can. Apparently there was even a discussion about increasing my scholarship too. My brother's friend had to subtly kibosh that for my own good. Best they didn't find out the truth. When I was young, I met a boy who I will call Zachary. He was two years older than me. Zachary was a stereotypical bully, nowhere near Biff from Back to the Future, and nowhere near that kid in the black shirt and Phineas and Ferb, but somewhere in between. But he was still ruthless. He likes to pick on you, call you names, and exploit your worst fears. And if he gets bored, he likes to start conflicts between best friends by using fake evidence. He seldom showed his good side. But whenever the kids came crying to the teachers, Zack used his charm and manipulation to make the kid look like the perpetrator, and he was the victim, and he won every single time. This is because Zack is the student head of the year and the captain of the soccer, swimming, and running teams. He bullies me because he sees me as an easy target. Here are some of the things he did to me. When he found out I was terrified of bees, he managed to install a giant bee farm in the school garden, and yours truly was chosen to be the main beekeeper. He manipulated one of my friends to think that I hated him. He framed one of my best friends for having alcohol on his possession. In a Halloween costume party, I came as a werewolf superhero and he accidentally set my cape on fire. Then came that fateful day. My geography class went on a trip going whitewater rafting. I was sitting in a raft with four of my friends and I was sitting in the back with Zach, who ignored me as he was under watch by three teachers. I can't fully remember everything that happened before the incident. Just bright sun, lots of water, and me screaming my lungs out. Then, suddenly, we went over a giant rock that ripped our raft into shreds in an instant. One moment I was sitting in an uncomfortable position, the next I was thrown like crazy in the rapids. Then pain on my head. Then everything was black. I woke up regurgitating water from my chest. I don't know how to explain the experience, but wet and Zack was standing over me with a look of relief on his face. It turns out that when the raft got ripped up, I hit my head on a large rock that knocked me out, and it nearly sent me to the bottom of the rapids that would have been my grave if Zack hadn't seen me and immediately dove down to rescue me. Zack, a guy who nearly burnt me and made me face my worst nightmare, had saved my life. I owe him an unpayable debt, 
And after he saved my life, Zack changed almost like a flip of a dime, and he apologized to everyone about what he had done. I eventually forgave him, and we have been best friends ever since. I'm a medic in the U.S. Army. In 2011, I was assigned to an infantry unit which I deployed to Afghanistan with. I was assigned to one of the infantry platoons as their medic. I was pretty squared away, so they treated me just like they would any other infantryman and let me do things most other non-infantry soldiers don't get to do. One of the things they would let me do was to stand outside the rear hatch on our striker so I could take pictures during our patrols. This is an important position especially in my vehicle since I was always in the trail vehicle of the convoy. The people in the rear hatches are responsible for rear security of the vehicle, and I was up there basically every time we rolled out in our trucks. On one particular patrol, which was destined to be my last, I had for some reason, which I don't recall why, not been allowed up there, and instead I was seated inside the vehicle. That is lucky thing number one. We had reached the halfway point of this patrol and stopped in the desert for a break to piss, stretch, refit, etc. When we were loading back into the trucks, I took the seat that I had on the way out, but when my squad leader entered the truck, he made me scoot over one seat, and he sat where I had been sitting. Lucky thing number two. A few minutes later, my squad leader, who was completely coated in dust from standing outside the hatch on the way out, asked me to take a photo of him with his coat of dust. I snapped one pic of him and checked it out, but it was blurry. Not exactly the smoothest ride. So I took another, clearer shot, and I'm really glad I did, because that's the last photo of him alive. I had put my camera away and settled back into my seat. Our convoy came to a dry riverbed, and we were slowly making our way across it. My truck, being the last truck in the convoy, was sitting still, waiting for the others to move. When the line did finally move up, our driver touched the gas pedal which moved our truck inches forward and onto the pressure plate of a bomb, which promptly exploded. The two guys in the rear hatches, where I usually would have been, both lost both of their legs. My squad leader, who had taken my seat, was killed instantly. One of my feet got banged up pretty bad and I'll never run again, but I was able to hobble out of the truck on my own accord and render aid to the other casualties. I had broken my leg and my back when I was 15. I was in constant pain, but I had no pain meds. I slowly regained the ability to move without crying, but the pain was still constant. I found that my dad took methadone, and after looking up what that was, I started self-medicating with it. The first day I touched it, I took 15 without realizing how powerful it was. I'm sure I would have overdosed that day if I wasn't surrounded by my friends at a water park. Anyways, after that, I realized it didn't just help pain, it also got you incredibly high. So I started snorting it constantly with my friends. Somehow, due mainly to genetics, I got up to snorting 25 to 30 pills a day easily. I cannot remember almost three months of my life because I was constantly high. I remember breaking my leg again and walking all day on it because I was an idiot and had pills, but other than that, it's mostly a blur. Anyway, school was starting up again and I could finally go back since my back had healed. I had lost touch with the majority of my friends by this point, so safe to say I couldn't wait. As school started up again, my pill habit grew tenfold. I couldn't make it through a class without going to the bathroom and snorting my pre-crushed pills. Once, in a lapse of judgment, I even did it in class, snorting it off the desk when my teacher's back was turned. I began selling drugs, and even broke up with this amazing girl because I was too high to deal with her. I was just a mess. Fast forward to about a month into school. The night prior, my friends and I watched Scarface while pulling Scarfaces. We thought we were pretty fucking awesome. We weren't. I wanted to go back over to my friend's house, but my parents had become suspicious of me and told me they thought it would be best if I just relaxed for a night. I called my friends to let them know I was stuck in the house for the night. I told them that tonight I would push myself up to 40 pills. One of them mentioned to me that maybe we should cut back on the methadone. I laughed and said, yeah, man, sure, tomorrow. We'll start cutting back. I snorted the pills and watched fucking Ratatouille until I overdosed. I had a unique overdose experience. I dreamt during it. I dreamt being at a party, talking to my friends, and doing a plethora of drugs. I dreamt being happy for a bit, 
but then feeling a tightening in my chest. It wouldn't stop, and it just got worse and worse. I felt myself dying. There was a mirror near me in my dream, and I saw my eyes constrict into points and my skin go gray and dead. I felt my heartbeat go slow and erratic, and I remember feeling so cold. My friends found me and called the ambulance, and they dragged me. I was thinking, oh God, this is only a dream. Thank God, I'll wake up in a second. And I did. In an ambulance, same as my dream. The first thing I heard was the EMT telling me not to throw up. I remember screaming and then puking my guts out. I passed out again. I woke up to them pulling me out of the ambulance, seeing my parents looking at me, and then I passed out again. Waking up to them telling me I needed a catheter, me screaming and fighting it, and then passing out again. When I finally woke up for an extended period of time, I had lost any feeling or movement in the right side of my body. My heart had been badly damaged by the methadone, and that I was so close to death they had to stick me with epinephrine or something. Apparently, my friend's mother, same friend I did pills with every day, found her cat bleeding outside in the morning and called my mom to ask what vet she used. My mom had heard a ragged sound from my bedroom, my body struggling to breathe, and freaked out. My door was locked, so they had to shimmy across the terrace to break in through my window. The doctors told me if it had been another 20 minutes, I'd be dead. I spent a while in the hospital, because when I slept apparently, I could only manage around 7 breaths per minute. It took a while to regain function in my leg, and my heart still has problems sometimes even to this day. I quit methadone and started fixing my life. Thanks to that cat, I'm alive. Every time I go over to her house, I make sure to bring some salmon over for him. I know it's like that a lot in these stories, such a tiny thing being the reason that you're alive, but when you actually experience it, it's really astounding. I have my life still because my friend's cat couldn't fight worth a damn. That's pretty lucky, I'd say. While out doing some grocery shopping, I found a bank bag with $11,000 and some change in a grocery cart. I had noticed the woman who had had that grocery cart before, and I had chased the woman down through 5 o'clock traffic. I finally catch her and wave her over into a parking lot. She pulls over, I get out and hand her the bank bag telling her she had left it in her cart. She's blown away by my honesty and gives me $100 as a reward. Pretty good, right? It gets better. I use 90 of it to finish paying my rent. My landlord had an incentive program where if you paid your rent on time from January to November, she would give you your December rent free to help her tenants give their family Christmas. I didn't know about it and I would have paid my rent late that November, but that $100 reward let me pay it on time. She told me I got December's rent free. I'm feeling good and go out to buy some scratch off tickets. I make a deal with my daughter, if I win, she gets half, but if she wins, she gets to keep it all and buy whatever she wants. I lost, but she won a free ticket. December arrives, I've saved up my rent and I'm planning on buying my daughter's Christmas presents. We get in a wreck. The woman who hit me was hysterical and her kids were crying. It turned out she was in the same boat as I was. My truck wasn't damaged at all because she hit my trailer hitch, but her car front end was crushed. She had just lost her job and had taken a seasonal job while she was looking for something after the holidays. We wait. The cops come and we trade information. My daughter ends up giving the woman's kid her scratch-off ticket to make her stop crying. They're sitting in the grass beside the road entertaining each other. The woman is trying to call her mother and explain what happened. I keep hearing her mother asking how she's going to pay her deductible and blah blah blah. My daughter ends up asking me if I'll help the woman. All the money I got is the money I was going to use to buy her Christmas gifts with, and I tell her that. She says she'd rather help the woman. I give the woman a check for 500 to cover her deductible. The woman keeps saying no and trying to hand it back, but I keep pushing it back into her hands. Finally, my daughter tells her it's her Christmas gift to them. The woman cries and hugs my daughter. A week before Christmas on a Sunday, we're sitting around the Christmas tree. I've bought my daughter some dollar store toys for gifts, and she's taking them to try to guess what's in them, asking for hints. The doorbell rings. It's the woman from the car wreck. She wishes us a Merry Christmas, and I invite both her and her daughter in. Her daughter hands me my daughter an envelope. Inside is a card. Inside that is $1,800. I'm confused. The scratch-off ticket my daughter gave them was a winner. They won $2,600. 
She told my daughter they were splitting it with her and told me that included the 500 I had given to them prior. By far the luckiest thing that has ever happened.